Hi, I'd like to thank Alberto and Anna for inviting me to give this keynote. I wish we could all be together in the same room, but I guess that's no longer possible right now. So I hope that you have, still have a good exchange at the Q&A and I'll be very happy to answer any questions you might have over email as well. I will talk to you about the lessons I've learned over the last 10 years of research that I've been doing on measuring residential broadband internet access. In particular, I hope to convince you that the active approach that we've been using so far has reached these limits and that we instead need to be focusing on the passive inference of the quality of experience. So I don't need to say how important home internet access is. I think we are all sort of kind of surviving this pandemic just because we can at least connect over the internet. And measuring it is really key. Like home users, when things are not working, like in the example I'm giving here, they want to measure what's happening and figure out whether it's the access that's having a problem or something like this. Similarly, ISPs and content providers, they need to measure so that they can know whether the service they're delivering sort of matches the quality of experience the users expect. Otherwise, users might just as well go to a different service provider. Similarly, because of all of that, governments have really been focusing on measuring broadband. So I'm giving the example here of the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission in the US, that over 10 years ago has launched the Measuring Broadband America program for exactly sort of understanding the state of internet and performance in the US. So that's some of the research that I've been doing over the years. The question is how to measure internet access performance and in particular, like which metrics should we use? Like people talk a lot about speed, but is speed sufficient? Like what are the exact metrics that we should use to capture the kinds of experience that people have at home. And once we know the metrics, how to measure them? You might be asking yourself, oh, there's so many speed tests. Yes, there are many speed tests, seems like a solved problem. But in fact, the problem is harder than what it seems. When you're doing a speed test, what exactly are we measuring? Are we measuring the access performance that ISP is giving you? Maybe if you're doing that for the home Wi-Fi, perhaps your Wi-Fi is what's bottlenecking your performance. Is it like a bulk transfer capacity where you're just measuring a single connection or are you really trying to saturate the access link and measure the access capacity? All of these are questions that are not easy to understand, but the most important problem is, it's very hard to know how any of these measurements match the application performance and the quality of the internet experience that users are getting at home. So just to give you a simple example, I did a bunch of speed tests in my home. So my provider is Comcast. So here is sort of the results I get from my provider. It's 327 megabits per second. With Upload speed tests, I get about 324. And with fast.com, I got 310. Guess there are little differences, but that's not the main point. So I, it seems from the stats that I have pretty good downstream performance and I should be able to watch a movie. But the other day I was trying to watch a movie and that's what I got. So the main problem that I want to talk about to you today is how can we really understand, like why am I, my movie is stalling when I have 300 megabits per second of downstream throughput. So that's sort of the, the sort of mismatches that I think we should be focusing on. And this is the plan that I have for, for this talk today. First, I'd like to start a little bit of history of the kind of research I've been doing on this, in particular in this confounding factor. So why was my movie not working when I have such a good speed? Because there are other things that are impacting my, my speed and my connectivity that was not just the access speed. So I'd like to start by talking about that, then discuss which metrics and measurement methods should we be measuring at home so that we can capture the quality of the access performance. And then I hope that I will convince you that speed is really not enough, that we should move from this active approach of measuring just speed to a passive inference of the quality of experience that people are getting at home. 
I will end with some final thoughts about internet measurements at large. So now let's go into the first part of this talk where um, looking into the confounding factors for home network performance. So I'd like to start just telling you a little bit of history. So I got into this problem of, with this question. So are users at home getting what they paid for? And in about 2009, I was very lucky, you know, as a measurement researcher, I got this huge data set from a company in France. It's like a volunteer-based kind of company. We have about uh, data from more than 10,000 homes in France. They're called Grenouille.com at the time. And what they were doing is they were doing measurements of access performance for different ISPs, mostly in France. So here in the picture, you can see the main ISPs that they had data for at the time. And what the, the, they were doing is they had this client software that they would ship to users that would download and it was doing periodic measurements of pings, FTP download and upload. It also had metadata on the ISP that people are buying, the service from, the kind of SLA, which speeds they should be getting in the city. So I was very excited, of course, to get my hands on this data. And then I tried to answer my question. And that's what I first found. So what this plot is showing you in the x-axis, so this is the 95th percentile for each one of these users. We had multiple measurements. So we are looking at the 95th percentile of their download speeds divided by what speed they should be getting, the advertised SLAs. So you would assume that if they're getting exactly what they paid for, the CDF here would be mostly at one. So we'd have a line here. As you can see, we're not really close to a line here. In fact, fewer than half of the users achieve 80% of their advertised SLA, which was really puzzling at the time. And we were trying to sort of figure out why was that happening? And in fact, it's more, I mean, of course, there's some issues that the ISPs were not giving exactly what they promised, but there's also a problem that there are many confounding factors with the data that we had. And it was very hard to sort of tease apart the access performance from that data set. First, the home network is an important problem. The Grenouille clients were running from a computer within the home, and so there could be bottlenecked by the Wi-Fi in the home, or by any cross traffic coming from other devices within the home. Okay. Second, the server location, like if the server is not connected directly at the access ISP, you might be seeing bottlenecks elsewhere as well that you're experiencing. Then another issue was the test method. As I told you, they were doing a single FTP download of a really large file. So you're sort of being limited by the TCP and that single connection and any sort of flow control, congestion control that was happening there. So now I want to, so the way that we went about our research was try to figure out, okay, so what should you do? Is the home network a real problem here? So that's one of the first things that we measured. So the question we had is, are throughput bottlenecks in the access ISP, sort of in your access link, or within your home network. And we built this algorithm that would just observe the packets going through the home router called home or access, and then inspecting the packets. If we are seeing the packet interarrival time was sort of really constant, we sort of claim the access bottleneck was in the access link. And then we look into the RTTs to figure out when the access bottleneck was in the Wi-Fi. Okay, using this method, we deployed that in the FCC measuring broadband America uh, deployment. And this is what we found. So let me just explain this plot. So the X axis here, we sort of beamed the homes in the deployment. So we had 2000, over 2,600 homes in this deployment. And we beamed them according to the capacity, the downstream capacity that we are measuring. And so for the first beam here, you have homes that had between zero and 10 megabits per second of downstream capacity, okay? And these bars, what they, they should sum up to one. So 1% 1 means all the cases where we determined that a bottleneck was at the last mile, so either the Wi-Fi or the access link, 
which was most of the bottlenecks that we were measuring actually. And so, and then the red part is where the bottlenecks were in the access link and blue is when the bottleneck was within the home Wi-Fi. As we can see, of course, homes that have less than 10 megabits per second of downstream capacity, they have most of the bottlenecks above like 60% on the, the access link. That makes sense because they have really tiny access links. But above 20 megabits per second, as you can see, all this part of the plot, we mostly see blue. Okay, so it means that most of the time, the bottlenecks are in the home Wi-Fi. And these uh, routers that we're measuring, they were 802.11n, and in the lab, they could easily reach 80 megabits per second or so. So we were sort of surprised to see that above 20 megabits per second, most of the time we're having bottlenecks in the wireless. And that's sort of because the way people place their EPs like in a closet or something so high because it's not a very pretty thing to do. But that really shows that we need to take that into account because otherwise, instead of measuring the access performance, we'd be measuring, in this case, is the home performance. So one first question that we're asking yourself is like, can we reduce the effect of the home network on the speed measurements? So there are two vantage points that we can have if you're measuring from within the home. One is to, like the Grenouille uh, was doing, place these clients within computers in the homes. There, it's very hard to sort of eliminate the effects of the home network, because if there's cross traffic or if the wireless is a problem, your tests are going to be affected by that. And the second idea is to sort of place your monitoring software within your home router or very close to it. And there it's better because you can directly measure the access link. And that's sort of the approach we took. So we, I was working with Nick Spimster's group at Georgia Tech at the time. And so sort of that's what the idea that we had is like just measure directly from the router. So there are many advantages. As I already said, like it's placed directly at the access link so you can more accurately measure any problems, any bottlenecks that come from the access link. Another advantage is that it's always on. So instead of doing the sort of one shot measurements that you might do when you're doing a speed test, for instance, which is hard to get baselines of performance, here you can periodically conduct measurements and understand how things are varying over time as well. The disadvantage is that it requires deploying infrastructure in people's homes, which is not easy to do, but we are lucky enough because at the time that you know Nick was doing and we were working on the Bismarck project, the FCC was contracting the some nodes to deploy boxes in people's homes. So that's how we were able to get the breadth of the study from the FCC some nodes uh, deployment. You know, at some point have almost 10,000 homes that were measuring using these boxes. And we could do a lot of more detailed analysis using the Bismarck boxes so we can really understand the confounding factors by changing things one at a time so that we can understand the causes of performance. So just to give you take away some lessons from the, you know, what the history of how I got into this, we've seen that the home network can be an important bottleneck on end-to-end -end throughput. Homes with more than 20 megabits per second of downstream capacity were often bottlenecked on the Wi-Fi. And so it's much better if you can directly measure from the home router where you can directly sort of focus on the access performance. Let's now look into metrics and methods to measure performance. So mostly people talk about speed, which is a little bit imprecise. So just to get our vocabulary right, when I speed, there are multiple metrics of speed. One is the capacity, which is the maximum IP layer rate or using sort of MTU size packets. The available bandwidth is the unused capacity. So if you take away the cross traffic on the link, that would be the available bandwidth. And when people talk about bulk transfer capacity, so that's the capacity that you can get, the throughput you can get when using a single TCP connection. And now there are multiple approaches for mostly people are talking about available bandwidth when they, they're talking about access performance because that's how like sort of what your provider is giving you to use. 
And there are multiple approaches for measuring that. The main thing that people use is just flooding. We're trying to fill up the pipe, sending as much data as you can. Mostly what people use is like multiple parallel TCP transfers, so they are sure to exhaust the capacity of the link, and then they do some post-processing to figure out like the number they give you in your speed test, for instance. For instance. The advantage of that, of that is that you're really measuring the effective available bandwidth. Like if you are able to put that much traffic in, the, in that link, it means that you can get that. The problem is that it's a lot of overhead. In particular, as access link speeds grow, the overhead can become pretty significant. So have, there has been a lot of research in trying to do more advanced methods that uses trains of packets or pairs of probes of various size and spacing. Mostly you might have heard of the probe gap model or the probe rate model for estimating the available bandwidth. So these new tools, they are really nice because they have lower overhead, which is great because you could perhaps do more of this. But at the same time, some of the assumptions that they have, they don't necessarily hold and it's a little hard to fully understand what exactly they are inferring. Let me just give you an example here. So imagine that I have um, a time here in the x-axis and I'm just faking a little flow in bits per second, you know, and my capacity is the blue line at the top and I'm assuming like fixed capacity there. So if I have a flow here, and at this point, I might be asking you, know, what's my available bandwidth? You'd say, oh, you have almost nothing as available bandwidth because this flow is using up all of my capacity. But if a second flow arrives, what's more likely going to happen is something like this, where the two flows are now going to share the capacity. So in that sense, like using a flooding method where you are introducing the, the traffic, it's easier to understand exactly what you would be able to get in the presence of elastic uh, cross traffic. So most of the popular sort of commercial speed test tools that we've seen in some of the examples I've shown, they all use this, the flooding method to compute the, to estimate the available bandwidth. So that's what we've been using in our work as well. So just to, Remind you, so we are measuring from the home gateway and we're going to be using uh, flooding methods. But even with these methods, there's still, we can see fairly different results depending on the method we use. So here we are doing the measurements from the Bismarck uh, routers and we are looking into what's the throughput you're getting depending on the type of method. And um, in the x-axis, I'm showing you the normalized throughput because the different homes had different baseline capacity. So we're just dividing the value we're getting by the capacity that we knew from those homes because we knew those people. So if you look at the single threaded HTTP, which is pretty similar to what we had in Gurdoy originally, originally, where they had FTP, a single FTP connection, you can see that you know, it's very hard to saturate the access that these users had. We had less than 0.8 of the normalized throughput most of the time. Given we are working from the router, we could also see if there was any cross traffic within the home. And that's what we're calling here the passive throughput. And where we are adding to that single threaded test that we're doing, any cross traffic that we could observe on the router, okay? And you see that the cross traffic did explain part of the difference that you're seeing, but not all. And then we used the multi-threaded TCP, which is often most of the tests are using. And there you can see that we could really saturate the link much better. You know, we don't expect to see exactly one because there's overhead of packet headers and things like this, that you'll never really reach one, but you can see that you're kind of getting much closer to what you were expecting for the capacity of those homes, okay? So it's important to figure out exactly which of the, the methods you're using, what exactly it is uh, inferring. Another issue that we, we identified in measuring speed, and these are for cable users, is that, so we are doing a throughput test over time, so that's what I'm showing here for a single user home. And as you can see in the beginning of the test, we could reach about 18 megabits per second. And then 
the throughput sort of goes down and it stays around 12 megabits per second for this user. Okay, so the cable provides doing this power boost where you could for a short time use more throughput and then you sort of reach a lower value. And you, we saw that in like three different homes, the same kind of behavior. So you can kind of see that a single metric of throughput might not necessarily make a lot of sense. So now, I mean, we've seen, okay, throughput is one important metric, but how does that relate to the application performance? Then we looked into web first. So here I'm showing you the page load times for a couple of popular websites that we are measuring also from the some nodes boxes in the FCC deployment. And here, so you can see that it's all log scale. And again, I'm doing the throughput bins according to the sort of binning the homes according to the access capacity. So from zero to one megabits per second, and then from one to two and so on. And as you can see, there is a clear trend in this plot. So all of the pages, I mean, some of them will go load much faster than others, but all of them in the beginning, it starts decreasing with throughput, but after about 18 to 16 megabits per second being, we don't see any improvement anymore. So throughput is no longer a factor after you have about eight to 16 megabits per second. Okay, so it stops improving there. But if I do the same plot, but now in the x-axis, I, I show you the last mile latency that we are also measuring this deployment, you can see that the page load time keeps increasing as less mile latency increase. So for web, we see the last mile latency is a more important factor after some point than speed per se. We also look into video. Here I'm showing the video resolution. Uh, this example is for Netflix. We had similar results for YouTube and Amazon Prime and Twitch. And what I'm showing here is the, so this, these results are more recent as you can see here as the capacity is much higher. So this is the nominal capacity. This is what the users contracted with the ISPs. And the different shades of blue represent different video resolutions. So from the lowest resolution to 1080p, which is high definition video. So we would imagine, we would expect to have more lighter blue as this nominal speed increase, but that's not really what you're finding. Okay, so there's something funny here where having more speed, we would assume that for video it would make a difference, but it doesn't seem to make that much of a difference. So then we looked at the same plot, but instead of looking at the nominal speed, we started looking at the 95th percentile of active throughput. So here is like what we are measuring, it's not what the ISPs are telling us that they are giving these users. And now there is a better correlation. So there is more light blue as we are going towards the higher capacity users, but still you can see even in like people who have above 500 megabits per second of capacity, they still have much, uh, a lot of their video sessions are in lower resolutions here. And so what it shows is like, there are many other factors beyond through the access capacity that is determining the video quality that these users are getting, okay? It could be the device type, perhaps the content is not even available at higher resolution. There are many other things that might be happening here. So just to wrap up this, this part, so we've seen that a single metric of speed may not be sufficient to categorize access performance. We've saw the difference between the short term versus sustained uh, speeds that we saw in for some of the cable users. We've also seen that the consistency over time, like some ISPs, they provide very consistent, always the same kind of available bandwidth, where others are gonna be varying a lot over time. So this is another factor that we should also be taking into account. And I think the most important point is that speed is really not enough. We think for web, latency becomes a bottleneck beyond 16 megabits per second. And for video, we saw a little bit of correlation, but there are many other factors as we saw that even the highest capacity beams, we didn't uh, have necessarily like all the time the best possible resolution. 
we should really move from active measurements of speed to passive inference of qualitative experience. First, access networks are getting faster. So here I'm showing you the average speed of access links in the US from 2007 to 2017. You can kind of see a really steep rise. So it means that active tasks are really too disruptive. If you're trying to fill up a one gig link, that's going really to take a lot of traffic. And worse, the access link may not be the bottleneck at all. So what is very hard to figure out what you would be measuring by just using this flooding of the access link. Second, applications are very complex, ever more complex, distributed and very adaptive. So if you go back to my example of you know, my video installing in my home, most video providers, they have you know, their servers, then local caches, caches and interconnect, and lots of different things. So my video traffic is likely coming from multi using multiple paths and from different locations within the network. Whereas when I do a speed test, you know, I'm exercising a single path going from some server to my, to my home. And the paths, they're not the same necessarily at all. Most likely they're not the same actually the paths to the speed test server and the application paths. Plus, the probes may be treated differently within the network. For example, when we started working with Bernoulli, they told us that some ISPs reached out to them to ask them how they can improve their results by prioritizing the probes somehow. And I've heard similar anecdotes about speed tests. So it's hard to know, you know if the results really mean much. So you might be thinking, oh, maybe we could just do active application-specific tests, similar to what we have done for the web results that I showed you earlier. We could launch particular web sessions or video sessions to figure out the performance. But these are very, very hard to design and maintain. And plus, it's hard to know whether you're capturing the sites that people care about, the videos that people care about. So really, I think that you know, the active approach have reached its limits and we should instead focus on inferring the quality of experience from passive measurements. So if I take my example again, where I have my video traffic coming from everywhere, instead of trying to measure all these different paths, I could have a passive traffic monitor close to my access point and then in that monitor directly observe the applications that matter to user. In my case, I could just be observing my video traffic and see, oh, the quality is not good now, it's stalling. Okay, so we need to be able to also infer the QoE from the network traffic that you're seeing. But that's not tricky, that's something that we have started in a recent project called Network Microscope. We're building a system to do this. We have a setup like this, where you have a cable modem and then you put a Raspberry Pi or an Odroid box in between the cable modem and your access point. So we can see all the traffic going through the home. And then from that, and like the encrypted video traffic, because most of the time the video services today they are encrypted, we are able to infer startup delay and resolution. I already showed you the resolution results earlier. And we had a a small pilot deployment with a few homes, like 10 homes in France and 16 in the US with the Wall Street Journal. I mean, most of the homes are in journalist homes where we were studying the correlation between the access capacity and the video quality, as I, I was showing to you earlier. So there are a few advantages of this passive QoE inference approach. One is that you're really capturing all the factors that matter for the user applications and the user experience in the home. Access speed is of course an important factor, but we are seeing that like if the quality is good, you know, we can see that the speed is influencing that. Latency, we also capturing other things that are harder to capture. For example, an ISP that has very poor peering or that has very poor connectivity to popular services, they are clearly going to have a worse service than other ISP that might, maybe I have less capacity in another ISP, but I have better quality because this ISP has good YouTube, Netflix caches everywhere. And so I can get all my videos if that's the application that I care about. 
Another advantage is that's more tailored for individual users because I'll be looking at the applications that I use. So if I don't ever watch video, then maybe I don't care that videos don't work well for this ISP. I could just be focusing on the things that you know, I care about. Okay, of course, this is not like a panacea and there are no problems, there are of course problems. So now that I'm just observing end-to-end traffic and trying to infer the quality of experience, I need to combine that somehow with bottleneck identification because perhaps the ISP is no longer the bottleneck, the home is not the bottleneck. We need to be able to say where the bottleneck is that's causing a particular poor performance. And that's where I see perhaps that uh, active measurements might be useful because if I just have a vantage point within the home, I can observe the end-to-end -end quality, but I won't be able to sort of identify which segment the problem is occurring. So in that sense, we could combine passive measurements with active measurements in that point. Another issue is that, you know, what should ISPs advertise? Speed is very appealing because it's a single number. So they tell me, oh, I'm selling you 300 megabits per second and I'm getting 300, then I'm happy. I say, okay, yeah, that's what I bought and that's what they're giving me. But now if we start talking about KOE, what should they say? Say, oh, you should be able to do two Netflix streams at the same time, plus a web session, plus this. So it's, it becomes a little bit more abstract. And so we would need some research, both what ISPs to advertise and what to present to users, how to communicate these kinds of information to users. So just to summarize um, the talk, you've seen that residential internet performance should really focus on QoE instead of speed. I hope I've convinced you that speed is not enough for you know, capturing the quality of experience that users have at home. And that pa passive measurement approach is really what we should be doing because you can capture the POE of the applications that people are, are using. And as networks evolve and use, usage evolve, me measurements need to evolve as well. Like trying to max out an access link made sense, you know, a decade ago when we had much lower access capacity. But now when you're talking about going towards a gigabit per second capacity on the access link, that doesn't make sense anymore. Now that I'm done with the bulk of my talk, I'd like to share with you some thoughts I have on research on measurements more generally. So we're talking about networks and applications evolving. So some things we're seeing now is much more in-network programmability and load balancing, like much more fine-grained traffic engineering. So what it means is that it's becoming harder and harder to make active probes that follow the application paths and that have the same experience as applications, as I was already alluding to before. Another issue that we have is the, with the explosion of connected devices, like with the Internet of Things kind of devices, and the IPv6 getting more traction, doing like internet-wide scans that we've been doing for, you know, all my career in measurements I've been doing these kinds of scans is becoming more and more prohibitive because it's very hard just to enumerate all of the address space and scan everything. So we need to be creative and how can we learn this internet wide behavior without necessarily this brute force probing of all of the internet addresses. So this too is like problems more for active monitoring. But another issue that we have that I, I just showed to you is that link speeds keep increasing and they are getting higher and higher. With that, it's harder to also do passive measurements because the time you have, depending on the kind of analysis you want to do per packet, you don't have a lot of time per packet when you're going at very high speed links. So we need to work on systems that can sort of speed up capturing packets and doing computations per packets online. Other problems beyond the networks evolving is like users and applications are also evolving. One thing that we've seen a huge uh, surge recently is concerns over privacy. So most of the research we've been doing on passive measures, just starting on a tap and looking to like a university traffic or things like this. Now, for instance, in Europe, we can no longer do that with the GDPR. So we should be worried as a community and figure out how we can still learn 
behavior, users, and things like this with the new laws that are in place so that we don't, you know, hurt users' privacy, which I mean, is an important goal as well. One direct consequence of these concerns over privacy is that now lots and lots of the traffic are encrypted, which prevents things like deep packet inspection, both for security and for application performance analysis as well. For instance, the video problem that I was talking to you before, it used to be possible to look into the dash packets, the HTTP packets, and figure out the bitrate being used. Now it's no longer possible because all of that is encrypted. So we need to be able to infer that somehow. Another trend is that content is sort of moving everywhere. All of the popular services, they have caches everywhere. The big content provider, they have big networks, so they peer with ISPs, very close to where users are. And so that's kind of uh, good and bad. It's good because now we have shorter paths that are crossing fewer domains. So there are less players in a way in between the user and the content. So people can perhaps do kind of end-to-end -end monitoring. So if you're, let's say you're watching YouTube video from home and you have a YouTube cache in your access provider. So your access provider pretty much has control of the end-to-end -end path, which is rare. It used to be rare, like you need to use tools like traceroute and things like this to infer what's happening in parts of the network that are out of your control, now you can have, you have more control. At the same time, it's hard because if you want to get covert an internet-wide view, you probably need to have vantage points in lots and lots of more places than what you used to need in the past. But these are some issues that you know, I've been thinking about, and there, I think that there's some new opportunities and some new methods that we can leverage to help us here. One, is leveraging advances in statistical learning. So in particular, if you think about now that everything is encrypted, so we might need to do inference. So we were doing the inference of the video resolution, for instance, from the encrypted traffic. There are lots of other kinds of inference that could be interesting, like application identification or device identification, the performance of other applications, and also some security threats, perhaps you can analyze communication patterns so you can identify sort of baseline behavior versus anomalous, anomalous behavior. So there, there's some interest research that can be done just using statistical learning. But of course, for any learning problem, there are lots of research challenges. One that I think we should work on together as a community if we can, is the lack of labeled data sets. So we need a way of as a community getting together and finding, I don't know, for application identification, all of these different problems that we identify as important, if each of us can contribute with parts of, you know, labeled data, I think that will really help the community in building the methods so that we can do these kinds of inferences. Another issue that we've seen is like, when in my own research, when you're doing, using learning, it's often easy to get some sort of clean training data where things just kind of work, you just train your classifier or whatever you want to do, and it works. But then when you apply it to real data that you're collecting on somebody's home or somewhere in the network, things might break just because of the measurement noise and problems that we have with the data capture itself. So another issue that I think it's important for us to think of as a community is how can we do the co-design of these inference methods and the packet capture, the measurement itself? because perhaps we can sort of tune like the measurements so that we can get more accuracy in our inference methods and tune the inference methods so we can actually use data that we can collect efficiently in practice. Another new, math, new technology, let's say, that I think we should be very exciting for people working in measurements is the programmable data planes. I'm particularly excited about the in-band network telemetry because that enables really novel measurement capabilities at switches. So I wanted to give you an example so from a topic that has been very dear to my heart is how can you trace routes or under load balancing. So here I'm giving an example. So let's say L here is a load balancing and I want to figure out if my packets going through the top path or the bottom, the bottom path. You know, before you just have trace route and have to make sure that it's going through the right path. If you have ENT enabled, one thing you could do is as the packets arrive at L, 
Elle can say, oh, it plans for me. And then all of the switches in the path can tag the packet. And at the end, when it's leaving the network, you can get the trajectory of that packet, for example. So that sort of changes how we we're thinking before we had to infer lots of things. Now the network can directly tell us, tell us the ground truth. But of course, this is not something that's going to apply in between domains. So it's going to be still restricted for a given network, a given domain, but still it provides lots of interesting possibilities that we as a community should be thinking about. For instance, we need to decide like what to measure and how to scale these kinds of measurements. So here in this example, you can kind of see that just getting my route is almost bigger than the payload of my packet. So it's a lot of overhead that can be, there's too many possibilities, too many things to measure. So what are the metrics that we should be collecting online and how to scale this, how to make sure that we can collect over, I mean, you won't be able to do it for every single packet. So how can we make this all work so we can learn for performance diagnosis, for instance, but not uh, overwhelm the network. So just, I just wanted to have like a few concluding remarks. I hope that I've convinced you for, uh, for internet measurements, the future is passive. There's a lot to do in passive measurements, I think. And I mean, I'm not saying that there, will be, there won't be any active measurements there. Of course, there'll be a combination like figuring out how to leverage passive most of the time and then activate active probing when needed, I think that's going to be an interesting area of research. And there are a number of interesting research challenges, in particular, sort of how to map sort of network performance to POE. Can you measure network performance and map and then infer what kind of quality that people are getting? Problems of scalability in general, how can you get passive and also coverage, like how can you do passive measurements everywhere? For my home network problem, it's simple. If I care just about my home, I have one passive monitor in my home, it's fine. But if I want to understand properties that are internet wide, how, how can you do that? Okay, so with that, I end my talk and we'll be very happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you.